Welcome back once again, everyone, to The Smoke Pit. I'm Jamie Goldstein. With me today is Chris Voss, who not only was on the New York City SWAT team's version of SEAL Team 6, not only an author of a number of books, he was a hostage negotiator for the FBI. Uh, the fun in today's conversation is going to be hearing how your skills as a hostage negotiator translate to like personal life. So if you've ever been going back and forth with your wife, husband, mother-in-law, boss, teenage children, uh, and thought that maybe some, some, some hostage negotiation training might help you through those scenarios, this podcast might do the same for you. So without further ado, Chris Voss. Chris, welcome to the Smoke Pit. It is my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So you're a pretty accomplished professional, man. Um, you know, from from founding the uh, the Black Swan Group, which we'll talk more about, uh, to being on a, a joint terror task force in, in New York and authoring books such as Never Split the Difference and the, the Full Fee Agent. Am I saying that right? You are. Yeah, okay, you're, cool. you're hitting it. Outstanding. I apologize. That resume will put you to sleep. Oh, my God. I know. Let's finally get to the interesting part, right? Um, and that is hostage negotiation for the FBI. Yeah, that's what that's what I did. I was I, I was I, I ran the hostage negotiation team for the FBI in New York City. And then later on, I was the FBI's lead international kidnapping negotiator, and which meant that any American got kidnapped overseas. It was my job to come up with a negotiation strategy that would get them out. And you had one pretty high profile case in that world uh, in particular. The Fox News reporter who was who was. Oh, Steve Santana. Yeah. Yeah, it was a great case. I'm sure. I'm sure. So so first and foremost, how did you get into hostage negotiation? How did how did you find yourself in that arena? Yeah, you know, completely by accident. I mean, I was originally a SWAT guy. I was on the FBI SWAT team in Pittsburgh. And then I got transferred to New York and I was trying out uh, for the FBI's version of the Navy SEALs, the hostage <laughs> rescue team. And I re-injured my knee. And I realized that uh, the knee injuries were probably just going to continue and you know, I want to stay in crisis response. We had hostage negotiators and it didn't sound hard. So I thought, you know, how hard could it be? I talk to people every day. <laughs> so, yeah. Were, were you, was that a pretty accurate assessment? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> Anything that anybody makes look easy is probably really, really hard. Yeah. And so um, it was a lot more complex and satisfying and rewarding than SWAT was for me personally. And I got into it and, you know, I'm grateful that I hurt my knee because if I hadn't, you know, I'd never would have gotten into negotiation. That's, that's an amazing outlook. And I'm sure a lot of people listening to this can, can relate. You know, there's a lot, a lot of people in our audience that, uh, you know, law enforcement, military that, uh, you know, ended up injured in one way or another and, and, you know, couldn't do what they love to do most only to find something even better on the outside or on the other side, I should say. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly what happened. Yeah. So this uh, it was uh, Steve uh, Santani. Was that that's his name? The reporter that went missing in Gaza? Yeah. That, that was, yeah. 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 Tell, tell me about that, man, because that that must have been insane. Well, yeah. You know, I mean, first of all, like he just disappeared, like he vanished. And and Gaza is a fishbowl. Like, you don't you don't vanish in Gaza. Somebody knows where you are. And um, I was at Quantico at the time in Fox headquarters up in New York. So, you know, I just got my car, drove up and sat down at Fox headquarters and, and wanted to stay as close as possible as what was going on. And they, they were great. They, they wanted me to do everything possible to help them get Santani out. But, you know, they any great news agencies got tons of sources. And they're like him and his cameraman. They just they just gone. Nobody knows where they are. And we don't think that's good because. Somebody knows if they're alive, and so the chances are they're dead and they're buried someplace because Gaza is a fishbowl. Somebody's going to know. It's like disappearing in, you know, I don't know, in Manhattan. Somebody knows where you are. Yeah. And nobody knew. And so initially we were certain, uh, we're not certain, but all the indicators, all the tea leaves were that they, they'd been killed. And suddenly when they surfaced, we're like, awesome. You know, thank God. You know, and then the communication started taking place. Uh, uh, a lot of the communication really took place mostly through the cameraman's wife. Um, and I and his name escapes me off the top of my head. But, um, you know, we started saying, like, here's what's going to impact the bad guys. 
in the best way. And a lot of it is very respectful communication. And we would say things like, don't refer to them as kidnappers, criminals, terrorists. Don't call them any names. Uh, if you want to address them in the media, say to the men that are holding my husband. And okay. I remember we got pushed back saying like, don't tell us what to say. And then they started saying exactly what we suggested. <laughs> they, you know, they said, don't tell us what to say, but they took every suggestion, which was great. It, it showed that they were coachable. So the communication took, started taking place through the media. The bad guys started to loosen up. They expected it to be called names. And then we got to, uh, we went for proof of life on them. And um, the proof of life came back half right. And everybody on our side says, okay, you know, close enough. <laughs> So what does what does half right look like? What 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 did, what what does full on like one hundred percent look like in that scenario? Well, you know, a good a good proof of life and and you know the the sort of the technical a proof of life, not necessarily a good proof of life, but a proof of life is essentially answering a security question. Okay. A question only you know the answer to. What was the name of your first dog? Uh, what was your grandfather's middle name? You know, what was your uh, the best man at your wedding? A okay. question you would only have the answer to. And um, uh, Olag, uh, I think, was a cameraman. Uh, we got we got a correct answer on one and an incorrect answer on the other. And so, uh, you know, on our side, again, uh, the governments and Fox News says, fantastic, you know, this is close. And we were advising them and we said, no, send a message back through the people that you're communicating that those answers are not 100% correct. And until they are, we're not moving forward, which is a <laughs> professionalism and things excel we wanted to send the people on the other side the message that the people on our side knew what they were doing and we weren't going to be bamboozled or get any half right this is going to be right or it's not going to happen right if good enough works the first time good enough will work the second time and and it's going to get worse the second time yeah you know it's only going to deteriorate it's like a you know the beginning of a relationship <laughs> you know, six months after you start dating someone, you don't find they're better than you expected. You, you know, you were dating their representative, right? You find out who they're seeing all the warts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's a, it's the same thing on in any, in any given relationship. Like we're not going to let this slide. And as soon as we got back to them, that that was not good enough. Then the whole thing accelerated very shortly thereafter. They were making arrangements uh, to deliver Santani and, and, um, and the cameraman Olak, I believe. Uh, to the border and we had an exchange and it was over now if i remember i i you know it was they, they wanted like every single uh uh islamic hostage that the u.s had released in exchange for these two lives is that there's something along those lines is yeah it, you like, know they, they, always, they always come up you, you you need a you need to have a clear understanding of the at the beginning of a kidnapping um and which is really what relates to business negotiations in general also like, is the other side really plan to make a deal? Like, is it going to be an issue of, is it request outlandish because they don't know any better? Or is it request outlandish because they have no intention of ever making the deal? Mm -hmm. And you've got to tease those two. Both those elements are there. Is there a deal and is the deal with you? And you got to tease both those out. It happens in business wow. negotiations all the time. It's shocking. It's the one thing that I was, the only thing that I've really been stunned by bringing business uh, hostage negotiation strategies to business. Like it never occurred to me how much nonsensical, no intention of making a deal business negotiations there are. Like it, we estimate at, the, at, at a bare minimum of 20% of the business interactions, one side never has any intention of making the deal ever. Wow. And, and one in five, that seems like a lot. And I got to tell you, that's at the low end. Mm -hmm. In some cases, the number's closer to 80% of the time. Like it's shocking. Wow. Like, why would people waste their time? There are reasons why they would waste their time. Most most of them are, uh, it's not uh, evil intent, it's more stupidity. Mm. Or people, what people, like free consulting. People are always looking for free consulting and they'll engage in a negotiation as if they're going to buy a product or, or proceed forward with business when what you're really looking is for a competitive price. I mean, like how many, mm -hmm. how many people are told to get three bids? How do you get a, a competing bid 
on uh, the vendor that you 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 got a vendor, you got a favorite. You know, you, you mm-hmm. want to buy a Xerox machine, you buy Xerox, right? But you got to get three bit. So you go to the other people. Do you say to them, "Hey, I have no intention of buying your machine, but I want to know what your best price is." They're not going to give you no. your best the best price. You got to lie to them about whether or not you're going to buy. So that that's that's actually a huge problem in the business world. Um, it's something that that's been the only shock on translating the skills from one place to the other. And so I'm assuming, you know, when when you were ready to step out of this this negotiating world, um, you know, the the obvious move was. By the way, how do you know about the Santani case anyway? I mean, I almost never get asked about that one. That was a great case. I love. Yeah, no, that was that was a that was a big one. I mean, I was I was you know fairly cognizant at the time. I was I think I was in the military at the time. Um, I think I was actually in Iraq when that happened. I think I remember seeing that on on. uh, uh, the news network in one of the one of the defects yeah that yeah, was that was, uh, that was one of my favorite cases but it you know it went quickly and not that many people heard about it so i'm getting a kick out of the fact that you asked me about it yeah yeah no i remember that was wild there was there was a lot going on in that in that region of the world um at the time i remember it was it was around that time frame god i wish i could remember what it was but but i think you know idf had had some kind of standoff and they ended up loading a bunch of dudes into a connex into like a shipping container and then using a crane to to lower the shipping container onto a roof where the bad guys were and they flooded out i mean they didn't know what to expect it was like a like a trojan horse I mean, it was it was wild so i've kind of always been fascinated by the by not only the politics but the but the techniques and tactics uh right that, that they use over there so so that you know when that happened it caught my eye and it it kind of stuck all right. Well, you so, gotta love an innovative rescue, like putting people in a shipping container. I like that. I love too. it. I love it. Those guys are wild. This is it's it's no no rules with them. You know, it's it's Occam's razor. Whatever whatever works best, that's what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, amen. So so yeah. How did um tell us about the Black Swan Group that you 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 founded that when you uh when you got out of negotiations? How did that go? Yeah, well, you know, it took a while for it to 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 get any legs, to get any traction. Um, I, you know, I we I we my son and I, are, and, and another guy Derek gone, but mostly my son and I, really sort of built this from the ground up, and and we knew it had application because I'd gone through Harvard Law School's negotiation course as a student, even though I wasn't a student at Harvard. They let me come in. And then I taught there later and the people at Harvard said, you know, brilliant folks who I learned a lot from said the dynamics of what you're doing are exactly the same as art. The dynamics are the same. The stakes are different, (laughs) but human nature dynamics are the same. Human nature, decision making. People don't make decisions differently based on circumstances. There's a a saying, how you do anything is how you do everything. Best indicator of future behavior is past behavior. People make up their mind based on fear of loss, identity issues. What does the future look like and and how can they affect it? No matter what. And that's driven by emotion. A vision drives decision. Emotion drives vision. So we knew that it applied really because we got, you know, blessed by the Harvard folks and then then used it at Harvard. And so we started, Brandon and I started consulting, Brandon and Derek, but Brandon and I full time. And then what it really started to take off when the book when the book came out. Well, like I we started training people. I left the bureau in 2007. The book didn't come out till 2016. And oh, wow. once the book came out, and it's understandable. There's you know there's a thing that uh, Robert Cialdini calls social proof. What's the proof that you know what you're talking about? And if you're going to teach people and consult people, your clients are going to say, "Well, do you have a book? <laughs> if and if you don't, why not?" I mean, if if you if you know what you're talking about, why haven't you written a book? And that that was really the critical issue. The book came out in 2016, and it's been it's been killing it ever since. It's led it's led the category for how, how many years is that now? Six years. Uh, and that's and that's never split the difference. Is that never correct? Never split the difference. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It's so uh, and it's so it's the thing that I love about it is. Like it sells well in every country on earth. Like it's in 36 countries and 33 languages. I'm in Dubai last year. This Asian female comes up to me and says, hey, I love your book. You know, I live in China and I use it all the time. And, you know, I said, okay, so you're Chinese? Yeah. And you use it in China, so you use it on Chinese. 
She says, yeah, because most people just think like it's an American way of negotiating or it's a cultural driven because this dude that wrote it is an American. So it must be American style. And it is not. It's human nature. Yeah. And it's used effectively in Pakistan, in India, in China, in every Latin American country that and people use it successfully. So that's been the cool thing about having the book out. And so what's what's funny about that is were, were you a fan of The Office? Did you watch that show? I have watched parts of it. Yeah. Do, do yeah, you happen to remember the episode where, where Michael Scott, Carell, uh, Steve Carell's character, is, is negotiating with Daryl from the warehouse about a higher salary? And he gets like that that book on negotiations and he's trying like every gambit that he can to set himself up for success, like change the meeting place at the last minute, sit there and don't talk for as long as you can. And he's just he's he's blowing every one of them. Um, and and it's funny because never split the difference was was um, sort of a negotiating gambit that I uh, that stuck with me uh, through a number of other books that I read. It, it really did stick to, to see it as the title. Um, I mean, it speaks a lot uh, about that gambit. Like, can can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and and I'll I'll throw out an advertisement for our co-author Tall Roz, because um, Tall's a genius business book writer. I mean, like any business book that Tall Roz name appears on, read that book. It's going to be a great book. And we started uh, the book with Tall with a completely different title. And Tall was kind of like, all right, so, you know, his title stinks, but well, I'll come up with one. And once we really work through the material, you know, what's the key lesson? Um, and the key lesson's got to be eye catching. And then there's got to be nuances to it that you don't get right away. Yeah. Because never split the difference also means the other side might be right. Like if the other side's right, are you going to make them compromise their permission, uh, position just because your ego needs to feel compromised, even though they're mm -hmm. right? And that doesn't make sense either. So, but we're, you know, we're about halfway, two thirds of the way through the book. And Tall says the title of the book is never split the difference. And my son, Brandon and I, we just went, <laughs> that's it, man. <laughs> you just nailed it. Yeah, That's amazing. So now I got to ask, what, what was the original working title? Killer Deals. Killer Deals. Yeah. Okay. I like never split the difference better. <laughs> <laughs> So, so tell us about the book. Um, what, what are people going to find when they get into it? Yeah. You know, depending upon who you are, like it's like, if you're a man, like, and tall was telling me this the other day, cause we were talking about it and he said, never split the difference has given men worldwide permission to talk about negotiations because it's emotional intelligence based negotiation. And he told me that, and he, a friend of his told him that. He said, "You, you guys, know, you, do you guys know what you just did? You gave men around the world permission to talk about negotiations. They didn't have permission to talk about it before. Never split for women. Well, it, it gives women the permission to be emotionally intelligence based and still be assertive, and not give in, and not compromise, and not be roll over, and that." Um, being a jerk in negotiations is not necessary to be successful. You know, being the biggest mouth in the room, being the most assertive, most aggressive person. That's not necessary to be successful. And it's women as a rule have a tendency to struggle with negotiations because perception is the best negotiator in the room is the person with the biggest mouth, which is completely wrong. Or the biggest jerk in a room is the best negotiator. And typically the biggest jerk in the room is the person that's going to say, I'm a great negotiator. <laughs> like and, and every time somebody says that to me, I know right off the bat that they're horrible and they're not making very many good deals and they're leaving nothing but enemies behind them. So depending upon who you are in the world, if you're, if you're quiet, analytical, introspective type, and you think because you're not loud or you're not an extrovert that you can't be a great negotiator, you need some an analysis. You need some introspection. You know, we teach people something we used to call effective pauses. We call dynamic silence. What's dynamic silence? Shutting up. Yeah. Well, the analytical types can't think and shut up at the same time. And they love to think. And you need that kind of thinking. It gives them permission to shut up and think <laughs> things through. So, and I think that's why it's, it's done so well globally. Uh, it's, it's sold over 2 million copies domestically in the U.S. and over a million internationally. And it's because depending upon who you are, 
there's something in that book that says what you are is great. You don't have to kill that. There's stuff you can add to it, but you've got some great skills already. So let's just add to that. Nice. So I, I love that, that you sort of identified that, you know, the book did one thing for men and something else for women. Does that sort of imply that, that men and women approach negotiations differently or have different inherent styles of negotiations? Well, they're, nur they're nurtured to approach it differently. And that, that's a great question um, because the skills and advantages, like women uh, are nurtured to be emotionally intelligent way ahead of men globally as a general rule. Now, this is a general rule and doesn't include everybody. But the sure. vast majority of, of women, fully grown females, see pre-adolescent females, and the pre-adolescent pre females, in many cases, are physically outperforming the boys. They, they, they mature faster, they develop quicker, and there are points in time when they're, when they're bigger, stronger, faster, they run faster. You know, you, you see it all the time. You see a little girl playing peewee football, and she's outrunning all the guys. Yeah. So, but the... Fully grown women look at that and they say, there's that there's a ticking clock on that. In short order, they are all going to be physically more powerful than you. So since this is coming at you, you need to learn to be emotionally intelligent now and get a head start on these skills. So women are nurtured to use their emotional intelligence before men are. So and then they get into the business world and typically you know, for better or for worse, and, and not taking any value judgment on him, the person that builds themselves as the greatest negotiator in the world is Donald Trump. And he's always talking about what a great negotiator he is. And he's loud and he kicks tables across the room and he makes threats. And I got a bigger button than the North Korean leader's button. You know, and he's very threatening. And a lot of the male-led examples of negotiation in the world are this, you know, blustering, threatening, attacking loud negotiator and women who've been taught emotional intelligence they like that doesn't that doesn't mesh for me so i don't know that i should do that that that's taken me out of who i am huh. can i can i have emotional intelligence and be assertive just not be the loudest most annoying voice in a room yeah and I that'll improve your skills and, and for men you know and by and large we taught to be aggressive then we drive deals from the table. Like I, you know, the, the, I've heard a very bad saying from a lot of business people say, I never lost money on a deal I didn't make. Well, you lost time. That means you lost money. How many deals did you fail to make because you were loud that you should have made that could have been great deals if you weren't so loud, if you weren't so aggressive, if you were looking for better answers with people instead of against them? So I think that's principally been the difference the stereotype of negotiations is is really, really poor negotiation strategy. You're at best if you're a loud, aggressive negotiator who always asks for more than, you know, anchors high all the time. You're a C plus, maybe a B minus negotiator. OK, you want to be an A plus negotiator. You look at Warren Buffett, quiet dude. You know, you look at Oprah Winfrey, phenomenal, friendly, um, interactive. Look at the examples of the people you really want to be like. Uh, Warren Buffett and Oprah Winfrey both have more money than Donald Trump does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'd I'd love to ask your opinion then. You know, since since you brought up Trump, I'd love to I'd love to you know take a look at the other side. Um, uh, she just passed recently, uh, Madeleine Albright. Um, I mean, oh my God, I I would I would fancy her a spectacular negotiator who started negotiations with, with generally with, you know, deciding what brooch she was going to wear to the table. Um, talk about her. I'd, I'd love to hear your opinion on her. If you have, if, if, you know, I, that, that's really interesting because, you know, I, I hadn't studied Madeline Albright that much, but as, as I reflect back on her, I mean, she, she got herself in the middle of a lot of things in her time and she didn't let the fact that some people might think that she was weak because she was a woman deter her. Like, you know, she she wasn't she didn't allow herself to be taken hostage by other people's no. perceptions. No, she wasn't. She wasn't loud, uh, but she had a, a great presence. You know, you, you're talking about picking out the kind of uh, the kind of necklace, the kind of brooch that she's going to wear. That's someone who's conscious of wanting to have an impact on someone. Uh, the other side of like, I am I'm professional. Um, I'm I'm not threatening. And I'm not intimidated. 
I'm going to, I'm going to sit down at the table with you. I'm going to do my thing. And your perception of me is not going to slow me down. I'm going to, and I'm, and Madeline Albright was not loud. She was not a table pounder. She didn't kick chairs across the room. <laughs> she represented the United States extremely well with an awful lot of adversaries. Yeah. Some of whom were known to have, quote, have a stereotype of not being conducive to talking to women. Mm -hmm. And did Madeline Albright care whether or not they wanted to talk to women? No. She no. didn't get bent out of shape. She just did her thing. Oh, she'd, she'd, she'd play into it. I think one, uh, who was it? It was some some secretary or minister uh, uh, in Iraq, uh, you know, when, when she was traveling over there that, that referred to her as a snake or said that she was like a serpent or something like that. So the very next day, she wore a, a brooch, a pin of, of, of a snake to the <laughs> table. Like, yeah, here I am. <laughs> When, uh, yeah, yeah. When, when <laughs> the Kremlin bugged her hotel room, I believe it was, or, or bugged uh, uh, a diplomatic office in Russia, and we found out she wore a pin of, of a bug. Of an <laughs> <laughs> she was wild, man. I, I've, I've always been fascinated by her, and, and, and uh, I miss her tremendously now that she's gone. But uh, that's, that's style. No, that's style. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a special kind of negotiating. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's you know, and and there's a certain amount of humor in that too. I mean, the the humorous, playful approach, especially in tense situations, will take you a long way. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I think there's a great picture of you know, well, she's got that that bug pin on uh, Vladimir Putin. You know, much younger at the time, kind of looking at her, a little side eye, a little annoyed, but with like sort of a smirk on his face, like okay. Okay, I see you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that very good. You know, it's sort of like we tested you and and <laughs> and you passed and with flying colors. Yeah, which gives you a little bit more clout at the table, perhaps. I would agree. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. So, is this the kind of stuff that that Black Swan Group uh, teaches, or you know, how to like outside of the book? How do you guys communicate this, this these kind of things? Yeah, well, you know, we coach this, we teach it, we coach it. We do a lot of coaching. It's one thing that I, I didn't really expect. I figured we would just teach people how to do this and they would run with it on their own. And as it turns out, we coach an awful lot or uh, much more of an appreciation of the fact that it's a perishable skill. Yeah. Like we got some ridiculously successful people that will not stop being coached and trained by us because they've gained an appreciation for the fact that it's a perishable skill. Like, yeah. you know, one of our clients the other day, we had, we had a, we did a special training this past year where we were just um, training a small group of high performing CEOs. And, and they tend to be entrepreneur CEOs, not, sure. not corporate CEOs. And I did a follow-up session with this guy who was super quiet. Um, nowhere near the stereotype of the negotiator. And you got to watch out for the quiet guys because they, they will really sneak up on you. <laughs> and he said, you know, you guys easily made me $800,000 this year. And I can tell you our fees were nowhere near that. Our fees are expensive. He spent a lot of money with us. But he, you know, <laughs> he didn't spend 10% of that. You know, his, wow. return, his rate of return on the investment was really high. Because he wants to continue to be coached by us and he knows it's a perishable skill. So we coach it a lot. Our, our, uh, we coach a highly collaborative style, but it's also not to be taken advantage of. And as a matter of fact, we coach people on how to, how to pick out the people that are taking advantage of them in the first half an hour oh. and then simply break off. Um, there's no sense in staying in a negotiation that's never going to happen. It's not a sin to not get the deal. It's a sin to take a long time to not get the deal. Interesting. And so there's some there's some real clear behaviors. Like I, I engaged in a, a long, frustrating negotiation just last week. And because I read the guy as someone that I was never going to make a deal with. Um, for, for whatever reason, you know, I, I put some money down on a vacation thing and circumstances changed on me in four hours and I tried to get my money back. And they said, you know, this is non-refundable policy. And I'm like, well, it was a mistake on my part. You know, I decided I'd take a shot at it, but I read this guy immediately had all the earmarks of someone that was going to soak up a massive amount of my time and was never, ever, ever going to make the deal. 
And I went in, and I that was my read in the first half hour. And I thought, let me play this all the way out and see if that's the way this is going to go. And it did. Because oh, wow. every now and then I got to test my reads. And the person that's never going to make a deal with you, the sooner you spot it and move on, the sooner you get that part of your life back. Okay. And I guess better to test that on something small stakes than something higher stakes. Yeah, because that behavior is evident everywhere. Like, all right, so I don't have that much on this, a couple of thousand dollars. But he's going to give me a great view of what a guy is going to make it all look like at all levels. And it, and it actually was very much, we had to learn this in hostage negotiation. We call them high-risk indicators. Who's the guy that's never going to come out? Or who's the guy that's going to kill if we don't kill him? And it it was always a him. And if 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 we got to kill him, we need to do it before, you know, the bad guy is going to kill people till we get the idea. That's the unfortunate reality. Now, is that a behavior that we can spot? And we found out it was, and it was, and we called it my former boss, Gary Nessner, put together a block of instruction called high risk indicators. The number one indicator was the guy who would not talk with you. Either he won't talk to you at all, or he'll talk to you through an intermediary. Mm. Or when you do communicate, you cannot get a word in edgewise and the things that he say make no sense Okay, because he's not communicating with you. Complete refusal to communicate with you. Huh. And zero partnership there. Zero, zero partnership, zero collaboration. And so I'm, I'm on the phone with this guy the other day and I'm thinking like first five minute conversation, this guy spoke for four hundred four four minutes, 45 seconds. <laughs> This dude ain't communicating with me. Like every time I try to respectfully interject, he talks over me, he doesn't communicate with me. He won't answer a single question. He just keeps going on and on and on. And then after he talked at length, I said, I, you know, I didn't hear an answer to my question. He said, well, I answered you. Well, you talked, but you didn't answer me. <laughs> and so I thought, all right, so this is my read of a guy's not communicating with me. Let me run this all the way out. Let me use tactical empathy. Let me use the stuff that I know works. If there's any glimmer of shot of making a deal and there wasn't, and I, you know, I'm testing my read. I need, I need the practice negotiations, a perishable skill, and you can't make a deal with everybody. So who, who do you pick out is your gut in the first five minutes? This is going nowhere. Four hours later, it was still going. nowhere. <laughs> I can't believe he gave you four hours. I mean, you, you must've like done something to keep him on the hook. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I empathy. I display genuine understanding. I genuine understanding. Like th there was a point in time, the second conversation I had with him, because I, I I thought, all right, so I didn't didn't display enough understanding. You know, maybe maybe I need to take a step back. I need to go back over my prep. I need to think about some more insight as to where this guy's coming from. And I go back into the second conversation, and I opened it up, and he says, he says, you know, I really, really appreciate you saying that. I mean, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And then he launched back into the same nonsense as before. And, you know, there were a number of things that were contradictory in what he said. Mm -hmm. And I tried to gently say, well, you said this and you said that. Now, how do those add up? I mean, and then he would talk for three minutes. And I said, I didn't hear you answer me. Well, I did, you know, so I'm like, okay. I, I used all the emotional intelligence tools that there were and they resonated with him and he enjoyed the conversation. And that's probably why he stayed on the phone. He enjoyed being understood, even though he had no intention of uh, working with me. So when it, when it boils down to either, you know, blind him with brilliance or baffle him with bullshit, he chose the latter. He was a baffle him with bullshit kind of person. And that is a very, that is a very clear type. It's Yeah. There, there, there are three types in negotiation. Fight, flight, make friends. Uh, assertive, analytical, accommodating. Accommodating okay. is a make friends type. It's about a third a third of the world. It, it's kind of freaky how it splits. The world splits pretty much evenly into third. So if you've got a, a, a friendly person who is um, uh, lying to you or deceiving you or having no intention of working with you, that's the baffling with bullshit type. Interesting. I love how I love how this this you know hostage negotiations such a technical skill set has such a range of application in everyday life. It's uh, it's funny. It reminds me of you seen the movie The Negotiator 
with uh, Samuel Jackson, Kevin yeah. Spacey, right? Yeah. When we're first introduced to Kevin Spacey, and he's sitting there, he says something like, "Like I once talked the guy out of blowing up the Sears Tower, but I can't talk my wife out of the bedroom or my kid off the phone." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, does does is are these books like? Just for people who negotiate or are these people who, you know, want to get the best deal on, on their cable bill or, or want to, you know, communicate like what, what they want their dream wedding to be versus what their father-in-law wants their dream wedding to be. You know, does it does it cross those lines? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a- a- everywhere that you're seeking collaboration mm. and that sounds really broad, but you're seeking collaboration with your significant others. You're seeking collaboration to create an event. You're seeking collaboration with your friends to decide who's going to go to, where you're going to go to dinner. I mean, wherever you're seeking collaboration, which is pretty much anything people do. I mean, even if you're asking for directions, you're seeking collaboration because you're, you know, the commodity you're after is information. Okay. If you're, if you're like my favorite, this, I've told a, a Starbucks example there's a guy that did this website called Secrets. Tell me your secrets. I'll share them with the world. Tell me your secrets anonymously. And I'll share them with the world. Whatever you're struggling with, somebody else is struggling with the same thing. So I meet this guy at a conference and he says that he got he got a Starbucks coffee cup still in the original wrapper to prove that it was from a Starbucks employee. And the note said, I give decaf to people who are mean to me. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's very, it's very good. Well, and actually, then when I started telling that story, I've talked to a bunch of people who acted, who you have been waiters or waitresses in restaurants, and they, they've all told me. They said, you know what, we do the opposite. Late at night, you know, somebody's been a jerk after dinner, and they ask us for decaf. We give them fully caffeinated coffee. <laughs> I mean, just don't mess with the people who handle your food. It's, it's, it's a no-brainer. Ne- never be mean to somebody who could hurt you. In some slight, subtle way. Oh, yeah. Especially the behind the scene folk. You know, yeah. you want to slap me in the face. You want to spit in my face. Okay, I'm going to see that coming. No, you want to pour sugar in my gas tank. I might not see that one. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. And there are a lot of people out there that will pour sugar in your gas tank. Yeah, yeah there are. Yeah, for some of, some of us more than others. <laughs> do you, uh, what about events? Do you have any uh, events coming up? We, uh, we do a lot of in-person training events. We got an event coming up in March, actually, in Los Angeles. Oh, cool. On our website, blackswanltd.com. And actually, now that the pandemic is over, prior to the pandemic, we, were, we had an event at least once a month. Uh, we were all across the country. This year, we're going to be, uh, we just did, and we were in Nashville in November. We're probably going to go back to Nashville next year, but we got stuff coming up in L.A., Atlanta. And Chicago, off the top of my head. Um, uh, I think we're probably going to be back down in Texas also. But the next one, I know we're in L.A. in March. Two-day training, phenomenal training. You got you to gotta know our – you have to be familiar with our stuff to come to a two-day. Two days really, if you've got the basics down, which I got I to tell you a great way to get the basics. A lot of people have told me, read the book and take the master class. And whichever one you did first, then the other one really makes it come alive. And I've had people say they read the book and then when they took the master class, uh, it, everything made sense uh, or vice versa. It took the master class, but when I read your book, it all came together. So those two things combined, you can get a long way. Okay. Do you, do you have a recommendation with master class book versus book then master class? Uh, it's a little, it may be driven a little bit more by how you like to learn. Oh. Like if you like to read, uh, because of Tall Raz, the book is very readable. It's very readable and it's interesting. A lot of business books are not like that, but Tall has the abis- ability to make a readable, enjoyable read book. Cool. So if you like to read, start with the book and then then uh, the master class is a great supplement. Now, if, if you if you uh, video interaction uh, at your convenience, which is teaching by both audio and video, mm-hmm. which is so your brain is processing it differently on your own time. You know, maybe you want to do that on the weekends or in the evenings. So how do you like to learn first? And then once you get into it, then the other the, the other way is a great supplement. OK. All right. Makes sense. And uh, you had mentioned the uh, the website. Um, and is that is that how people would get in touch with uh, 
Black Swan Group if they were interested? There's a yeah, there's a ton of free stuff on the website. Again, blackswanltd.com. Also, we put out a weekly negotiation newsletter that's concise and actionable. And if you go on the website, I believe on the upper right hand side, there's a tab so that you can subscribe to the newsletter. And that gets emailed to you on Tuesday morning at approximately 7.30 in the morning, whatever time zone you're in. We adjust to your time zone, your Tuesday, because that's a good day to be taking in information after you got Monday behind you. <laughs> and then also, it's it's one single, concise, actionable article instead of nine, which you can't make up your mind, plus the now announcements on the most upcoming training. So you can get announcements on new products or the training via the newsletter and, and a lot of people really use the newsletter as, as a way also to stay sharp. Okay. Very good. Very good. And what about the, uh, what about the books? Where can we find those? Amazon, you know, Amazon, Amazon is, is still the best game in town and, uh, and, and the best price, both books never split the difference. And the full fee agent is for residential real estate agents. All right. I got one more question before I let you go. And that is if you were going to negotiate against Anyone in this world, past or present, uh, who would it be and why? You know, I you can pick the stakes. Like you could pick the stakes. It could be because you think you could beat them. It could be because you want to challenge yourself, because you want to learn. Who's someone who'd be fun to negotiate against? Well, you know, I mean, I'm I'm very much a student of the Mid East peace negotiations throughout the years. Okay. And there's a great documentary called The Human Factor which details most of what happened from Bush 41 right up to really the end of the uh, Clinton administration, which was when Yasser Arafat died. Yeah. And to, you know, they came so close so many times there. I mean, they came really close and, and both sides at different points in time really wanted peace for their, they really wanted what was best for their people. And, and every leader involved in those conflicts has come to the point where collaborating, they know that the, the best outcome is collaboration. And to, to have been involved in any aspect of that would have been um, would have been amazing. Okay, very good. Chris, this was, this was a lot of fun, man. I really appreciate you joining us. Um, you provided a lot of really interesting, not just information, but perspective. You know, the information's cool, but the perspective makes it stick. It really makes it land and, and drives home the value of it. So thank you. Thank you for that. Thanks, man. My pleasure being on. It was a, that was a great conversation. Yeah. Yeah, it was. I'm glad you enjoyed it, too. All right. Very good. Well, um, again, this has been The Smoke Pit, and uh, we'll see you next time.